Hey folks, welcome back. This is the first video in a series on the Cavendish experiment. I'll be recreating this experiment over the summer, and I'm going to take you through my thinking, my process, step by step, um, to get to hopefully a result that uh, will get us a nice um, reliable value for the gravitational constant, just as Cavendish's experiment was able to do. So, uh, today it's going to be a little dry, I admit. We got a lot of math. I know that's not every, not for everybody. Kind of looking at you flat earthers, but uh, we'll we'll give it a shot anyway here. So follow along here. I've got plenty to share with you. So Cavendish comes up with this brilliant idea to measure the gravitational constant, or or it derives this experiment that we can do this from. There's a huge amount that all has to come together in order to make this experiment work. So, a few of the things that we have to be able to, to work with. First off, we've got the uh, the law of universal gravitation here. Um, and so that's the uh, Fg equals gm1 m2 over r squared. So obviously that's going to be important. We're looking for g. That's where the equation or where the constant shows up. Now, we're going to do this, we're going to measure this using a torsional balance, so we have to look at torque in a few different ways as well. Um, so next up we've got torque from a non-distributed force, a force that acts just at a single location, and we're going to be treating the, the spheres on the ends of the rod as though they're experiencing a force of gravity that's directed right at that location where the sphere is. So that's this equation here, the torque equals RF sine theta. So in that equation, the R is going to be the distance from, from where that force acts to the axis of rotation. F is the magnitude of the force, and the theta in that is the angle between the R vector and the F vector. For us, I'll just set up the experiments. That'll be 90 degrees, so that'll be uh, sine 90, so it'll drop out of the equation. Sine 90 is 1. Next up, we've got torque caused by twisting a string or a wire, and it turns out that there's this constant. We use a kappa for that. The constant represents um, just how hard it is to twist the wire or how much force that wire will apply, how much torque that wire will apply um, per unit of rotation, and we're going to use theta to mark that. That's the, the angle in radians that it's been twisted. So if we double how far it's been twisted, we should see double the torque trying to twist it back as well. Um, also important here, we are going to need that value for kappa at some point in our calculations, and it's tough to measure directly. So um, what we're going to do instead, and what Cavendish did as well, is to use this equation for the period of a torsional um, oscillator. So as it twists back and forth, that period of oscillation depends on really just two factors, the rotational inertia, so how the mass is distributed, and also the that value kappa, um, so that constant of, uh, um, of torsion. And so we're going to uh, um, do some timing measurements on this to figure out what our period to go back and forth one time is. That goes into this equation for t, and we've got the 2 pi, the i here, that's the rotational inertia, and then we've got kappa that we can solve for. Next up, rotational inertia equations, we'll need those. Um, we'll have two um, large masses at the end of, a, of the rod, and so those are going to be treated like point masses, so that's our equation there. And then we're going to have um, a long, thin rod that's holding the, the whole thing, and it'll be rotating about its center point, and so that's our equation for that one. So, our basic setup, this is a top-down view over on the left side here. Um, we're going to have the, the rod suspended from the string, and the two masses on the end, I'm just using a lowercase m for those masses. Those will be our smaller masses, and then we'll have big masses that um, are nearby, and those are going to be providing the gravitational force that causes the whole thing to twist. Um, I've labeled the distance from, uh, uh, from the center here to each one of the masses over here and over here, uh, and that's going to be capital R, so that's the radius or the, the distance from the center to one edge of this, uh, of this rod. Um, and then after we apply uh, a torsion, uh, sorry, a torque, um, by putting those other masses in, the whole thing is going to twist by some angle, and we're going to label that one theta. That's this angle here. It's the same as this angle right there. Um, and so theta shows up in um, also in our, our torque equation um, for the torque caused by a non-distributed force, so we'll have to be careful with that. But like I said, that one's just going to be 90 degrees, so we'll drop that one out of the equation right away. Um, we've got big mass, big M here, and big M over here. 
and those are going to be the, the masses of the large objects that are on the floor near our torsional balance. We're looking for where that equilibrium position goes to, so we expect our balance to oscillate just slightly back and forth. Um, an equilibrium is going to shift though, so if it's oscillating, on, here's a top-down view here, if it's oscillating back and forth like this, we expect that it's going to shift a little bit and oscillate back and forth around that new equilibrium point. So in both the initial and the final state, we're showing the bar in its equilibrium position. And so we need to measure how far off that new equilibrium position is from the old equilibrium position. That's what that value for theta means, and that's caused by adding those big M values. Now the distance d labeled there in the corner, that distance is going to be the center-to-center the -center distance between one of our big masses and one of our small masses. And we'll make the whole thing symmetrical so it'll all be the same. Um, the, the d on the left and the d on the right will be, on, be the same size. And then we've got our gravitational force label there. We expect this to be extremely small, so we really have to develop a very, very precise um, device for measuring this. So that is why it's taken a whole summer to get this set up. It's a really small force, really tough to measure. All right, so now into the math of the situation. Um, we are looking for our new equilibrium, and in equilibrium we have the net force is zero and the net torque is zero. The forces we're not going to worry about too much. We've got gravity from the earth pulling down on um, uh, this thing and then the tension pulling it back up those take care of themselves. What we're interested in is the torque on this bar. So in that new equilibrium position, we're going to have two different things causing torque. We're going to twist it off center because of gravity between the ball on the balance and the ball on the ground, and on the other side too, the ball on the balance and the ball on the ground. And then trying to twist it back, we've got the string that resists twisting, and so we've got that torsional constant for the spring. Um, to, to think about with that one. So what we know for equilibrium is that the torque going in one direction and the torque going in the other direction have to be equal or the total torque is zero. So on the left side of the equation, this is all the string information on the left side. The torque caused by the string or the wire trying to twist back to its original equilibrium position, that's got to be equal to the two torques provided by gravity over on the right side there. And so those would be the same size. We'll just make sure the masses and the distances are the same on those. So we'll just replace that with a two torque from gravity. And then in the next step here, I've replaced this term here with kappa times theta. So the torque caused by the string, that's kappa. It's the torsional constant times theta, the angle that it's been twisted there. Um, and then over on the other side, we've got the two times r fg sine theta. So r, that's the distance from the axis of rotation to the spot where the force is applied. F is the size of the force. And then this theta, remember, is a different theta. So that's the angle between um, the R vector that points straight from the, uh, from the middle out to where that force acts and the direction of the force, which it turns out is going to be perpendicular to the bar. So R is going to go along the bar. FG is going to be perpendicular to the bar. So that angle is going to be 90 degrees. So this whole um, term, that, that whole sine term, is going to drop out then. And so we're left with kappa theta equals 2RFG. Not too bad so far, but we got a lot of ground to cover. Um, at this point, though, I'm going to stop and think about um, some design considerations right here. If I isolate theta for just a moment, I get 2RFG over kappa. I need to be able to measure this angle. And for it to be measurable, it needs to be as well, as large as I can get it. The larger it's going to be, the more precisely I'll be able to measure it. So I want to try and maximize that angle theta. So a few things I can do to maximize that. I've got r up here in the numerator. So I'm going to try and maximize r. I want to get those masses. r was the distance from the center of the pole to the place where I have the masses. I want to get those masses as far from the center as I can and use as long a pole as I can get to work. At some point, though, we run into practical constraints. Does, does it fit in the space that I have to work with? Is it too heavy for me to support with a really thin string? Which gets us to our uh, point in just a second. Um, FG is up here, uh, and so we want to maximize FG. We want to try and get that force as large as possible. Now the big thing that we're going to do on that is use a big mass on the ground. Um, on the balance we have that rotational inertia that's going to figure in with that, but the big consideration there is just a practical one. I need to be able to support this with a thin wire. 
So if I put a big mass on the rod, it's going to get heavy. And so the thin wire isn't going to do a good job holding it anymore. So big mass on the ground, and we're going to try and get that mass as close as possible to the hanging masses without touching so that we can deliver that gravitational force. And then the last thing to look at here is kappa, which is in the denominator of the equation. And so we want to max, sorry, we want to minimize kappa. And so kappa is that torsional constant. It depends on the thickness of the wire and also the material. Now, I'm not quite sure what is going to work best for this. So I have a few ideas on things I want to try out. I know that I want to get this as thin as I can. So I'll look for really thin wires or strings or lines, um, but I'm not sure what materials are going to work best. I'm just going to figure this out by experimentation, um, and so I'll be using that uh, that pendulum, uh, sorry, the, the period of a torsional pendulum equation, and just try out a few different materials with this and see what gives me the lowest value of kappa, and go with that as my optimal material for this. So a little experimentation, experimentation to come on kappa. All right, so let's dig into the rest of the algebra trying to get to a value for g now. All right, so like I said before, kappa is really tough to measure directly. I certainly don't have any equipment that could do that, but we can measure it by looking at the period of our torsional balance. So let's bring that back here. The period for a torsional balance is 2 pi times the square root of i over kappa. And so I'm going to isolate kappa and substitute that into the equation here. So I'll do uh, both sides divided by 2 pi and square both sides. Gets me i over kappa. And then I'll multiply both sides by kappa, divide both sides by the t over 2 pi squared, and get kappa is equal to, let's say it'd be 4 pi squared i over t squared. Okay, so once I uh, have measured that uh, period of oscillation, um, I can use that and the rotational inertia for that system and figure out a value for kappa. Um, and so that'll get me to this equation then. Um, so all I've done is substituted kappa and rearranged a little bit on this one. Um, so now let's see, we go through the equation for pi squared, that's a constant, we're good there. I, we still have to calculate for this. We have a lot of work to do. The theta, we're measuring directly, so we're using that um, laser that I used in my, my last attempt on this, bouncing off a mirror and striking a point somewhere far away, so we can measure that angle pretty precisely with that. Uh, T squared, got the old stopwatch on that, no problem there, or some uh, you know video analysis. Uh, on the other side, we got two, we've got R, R we can measure directly. FG, well, we are not going to measure that one directly. That contains the term that we're trying to calculate. So let's uh, go on here. We're going to uh, need to put in a value for i somehow, and we're going to need to expand that fg term. So let's take a look at i first. So i, the rotational inertia, is going to be made up of three parts. We have the rod itself, and then we have the two masses, two heavy masses hanging on the ends of the rod. So um, going back up here, we had the equations for those. For the rod, we have 1 12th times the mass of the rod times the length of the rod squared. 1 12th times the mass, and I didn't give a special variable for that one, so just mass rod, times the length of the rod squared. Okay, and then we've got two point masses as well, and so that'll be the two uh, masses at the end of the rod. And for point masses, we're just using mr squared. And so that's the little m that we used. Um, and then the r is the distance from that mass to the axis of rotation. So that was the capital R we were using. Um, and then squared. Separate this for a second. Okay, now uh, to simplify this a little bit, uh, I know that the the length of that rod is just going to be 2r. We've got that r distance from one end to the middle and from the middle to the other end. So that'll be 2l. So I'll plug that in here, 1 12th mass of the rod times 2r, and that gets squared. Okay, plus 2mr squared. And so that's going to give me, we've got 4r squared inside the parentheses. Multiply that out, we have 1 third. 1 third mass of the rod times r squared plus 2mr squared. 
And then I'll go ahead and pull out the r squared from that as well. So we have i equals r squared times one third of the mass of the rod plus two times the light mass is hanging on the ends of the rod. All right, now with that value um, calculated, we can substitute into our uh, equation in the spot where we had i here before. There's i. We'll put in instead that r squared times quantity one-third m rod plus two over case m. All right, so that's all that we've done there. Next step, um, at, at this point we have um, everything on the left side is something that we can measure. So we've got r, we can measure that one directly. The two masses, the mass of the bar and the mass of the, um, the, the hanging masses, we can measure those. Angle theta we can measure, period we can measure. Over on the right side though we still have that fg term that we need to expand. So all I'm going to do is plug in the law of universal gravitation um, equation into that space. It's the big G m1 m2 over r squared equation. And in this case, the m1 and m2 that we're talking about is the, the hanging mass and the big mass that's on the floor. So little m and big M respectively. Um, and then the distance between those is what goes in for r in the equation. We had that labeled d before, so I'll just stick with that convention and use a d squared on that one. Um, doing a little simplification and rearranging for g, we now have an equation where everything on the left side can be measured directly. So just to check that again, we've got big R, theta, d, the distance between the, um, the big mass and the little mass once we reach equilibrium. So we'll measure that one directly as well. t squared, we've got all the masses in the next term there. Every one of those things can be measured directly. Now it's a lot to do all in one equation, so we'll break it up into steps when we actually do it, but this is just to check that we do in fact have a procedure that will allow us to calculate a value for g. So, next steps on this, I need to, uh, well, I need to design the device. I've been looking over Cavendish's original device on this, and he's a pretty smart cookie. I think I'm going to keep a lot of what I'm seeing there. The other thing that I'm looking at is um, an Opasco for, for one and maybe others. Um, actually set up uh, like classroom demonstration versions of this that you can buy. Um, and so I'm looking at some of their designs and getting some ideas on this. Uh, big critiques that I saw on the last few designs, um, the biggest one is just eliminating error currents, which was something I mentioned in the videos and in the comments before. That, that was a terrible problem, especially being in a school where I couldn't control the climate, uh, climate control stuff at all. Um, so. I'm going to definitely enclose this one uh, make it so that we're not going to have to deal with air currents. Um, other things to look at here, i got to figure out what material to use for my wire or for my string. Um, and what I want to do for my big masses, I'm thinking a big old bucket of concrete ought to work well for the, the masses. I might see if I can track down some scrap metal too, then it'll be a little denser and work a little bit more as a more compact mass for this. Um, so. Over the summer, I'll be uh, designing and building and testing this thing out, and by the end of the summer, we should have uh, a usable result for this. So I hope you'll stick with me for that journey. Um, by all means, click on the subscribe button and ring the little notification bell so that you get the email alerts when the new videos come up. Uh, please do like and share when you, uh, you like the content. Uh, or, hey, if you don't like the content you want to share it with, uh, with other people who are going to hate it, that's fine too. Get it out and let's get a discussion going. And comment in there. I'll be reading the comments on these and responding as I'm able. Thanks very much for watching. I look forward to doing the rest of this with you. Bye-bye.